Welcome everybody to this uh, web conference. Uh, from 50 years of a malaria-free Italy towards a malaria-free world. This is a conference which is broadcast from uh, Aula Pocchiari of Istituto Superiore di Sanità. Um, we will have uh, some time during the web conference, uh, the official welcome from President of Istituto Superiore di Sanità, Professor Brusaferro. Uh, at the moment, uh, we can uh, have uh, uh, the, the welcome from uh, uh, the University of Sapienza in Rome, uh, Rector uh, Professor Gaudio, that will be introduced here from, uh, by uh, Professor Della Torre, uh, who is uh, co-organizing uh, with us uh, this event in collaboration with uh, the Italian Malaria Network. And uh, um, so I leave to Donatella the... Sorry introduction of the director of Sapienza. Okay. So thank you, Pietro. Welcome to everybody. And uh, yes, I uh, introduce uh, the presentation of the director of Sapienza, Professor Eugenio Gaudio, who is uh, providing us uh, a historical uh, view of uh, uh, research ongoing uh, in Sapienza since centuries on, uh, on malaria. It's a pleasure for me to introduce this web conference celebrating Italy's great success in the fight against malaria 50 years ago. This has been one of the greatest public health achievements in our country and represents the epilogue of centuries of studies and scientific discoveries which have been translated in a very effective education campaign by the synergic interaction of scientists, physicians, engineers, teachers, and politicians. It's certainly not my role here to recall all the heavy steps leading to this success. Instead, I would like to spend a few words on the pivotal role of scientists from Sapienza University, not only in creating the basis on the current lab knowledge of the biology of the parasites and the vectors, but also in leading the translation of the new knowledge into effective control interventions. Already in late 17th century, Giovanni Maria Lancisi, professor of practical medicine at Studio Mundi Sapienze, the former Sapienza University, was the first to associate the presence of intermittent fevers plaguing Rome in that period to the fluvia of marches and presence of mosquitoes. Almost 200 years ago, several groundbreaking discoveries were made by a group of prominent professors in Sapienza University. With different backgrounds, but a common interest in contributing to the severe malaria sick cycle and interrupt it. Among these, Ettore Marchiafavi and Angelo Celli significantly contributed to the conclusive association between malaria disease and plasmodium parasites, while Giovanni Battista Grassi, Amico Pignani, and Giuseppe Bastianelli unambiguously proved the role of Anopheles mosquitoes in malaria transmission. But what I think is even more remarkable is how this new knowledge was translated into the development of an integrated approach capable of breaking the malaria transmission in Italy and serving as the basis to reach the same success in other temperate regions. The synergic efforts of Sapiens academics and the instrumental role of Professor Shelby, director of the Institute of Hygiene and Parliamentarian, were successful in creating the concept of integrated malaria control and in transferring it to the political debate. Italy was the first country to promulgate a law guaranteeing the free distribution of Cunin with allowed to crucially minimize malaria, malaria mortality at the beginning of the 20th century. 
At the same time, other innovative concepts were introduced in the fight against malaria, such as the mechanical protection from mosquito bites, strongly promoted by Grassi, and the need of environmental changes to eliminate Anopheles breeding sites. Finally, last but not least, the capillary education campaign facilitated acceptance and implementation of prophylaxis and anti-vector measures. In few decades, these integrated measures paved the way to the final eradication of malaria by indoor DDT residual spraying, which we are celebrating today. The contribution of Zapienza scientists to the field of malaria did not stop with malaria eradication from Italy and Europe. Since the 60s, Mario Coluzzi, lab professor of parasitology in the Faculty of Medicine at Sapienza University, perpetuated Grassi's legacy of malaria entomology. In the following 50 years, Professor Coluzzi contributed to seminal advances in malaria entomology and epidemiology as well as in building research capacities and infrastructures in Africa. Today, a new generation of researchers of Sapienza is following his footsteps and providing important contribution. I am glad that the opportunity of the celebration of Italy's success against malaria is taken by the colleagues from Italian National Health Institute and from the Department of Public Health and Infectious Disease of Sapienza University to propose this web conference, which will allow the director of the World Health Organization Global Malaria Program and three eminent scientists at the forefront of malaria research worldwide to provide an update on the current news and challenges in the progresses towards malaria elimination worldwide. Thank you very much for your so kind attention. Thank you. Now it's time for me to introduce the first speaker uh, of, uh, of today, uh, who is uh, Dr. Pedro Alonso, the director of the Global Malaria Program of the World Health Organization. And uh, I really have nothing to say to introduce uh, Pedro. Uh, it would be too long to summarize the contribution that Pedro gave to malaria, uh, to the fight against malaria. Uh, I would like only to single out uh, uh, the way I think uh, Dr. Alonso, uh, several years ago, started to uh, perceive the need uh, to build a really innovative and novel uh, research and development agenda to meet the new challenges of elimination and, uh, and eradication. And uh, from 2010, when he was also establishing the Barcelona Institute of Global Health, he was also starting a very important consultation program between scientists, agencies, and uh, uh, stakeholders, which uh, were engaged to, to, to populate this uh, agenda of uh, important concepts uh, that we will see uh, in, in the course of this, uh, of this presentation. So uh, I just immediately uh, leave the word to uh, Dr. Pedro Alonso, and we are really pleased and honored to have uh, the possibility to hear about progresses and challenges on malaria from uh, the, the very voice of uh, the director of the Global Malaria Program of the World Health Organization. Thank you, Pedro. Th th thank you, Dr. Alano and, and uh, Professor Alano, Professor de la Torre, the Rector Magnifico, uh, President of the Instituto Superior de Sanità. It, um, believe me, it's it's um, it's it's a real honor uh, to be here with you today. Um, and it's far too long since I was in in Rome and uh, actually with Professor Coluzzi and. Um, and uh, I have heard already today the, the names of, of Lancisi, of Celli, of Grassi, of Bastianelli. Um, 
the Quinina dello Stato, the translation. And um, as an amateur uh, lover of history, um, I've always strongly believed that, um, that the Italian school of malariology, the Italian school that formally brought science into the study of malaria from the description of, uh, of the life cycle of the parasite to um, the transmission uh, of human malarias by Anopheles mosquitoes, the translation of, of that scientific knowledge into action uh, to control and eventually eliminate the disease. The use of, as has been alluded already, of the um, political implications of public health and uh, making anti-malarials free. The endless debate as to how much did um, indoor residual spraying with DDT contribute versus the mass uh, availability or accessibility to anti-malarials. Um, I have always found um, and, and would like to honor the the Italian researchers, the Italian school of malariology as the most important school of malariology in the history of, of this disease and, um, and uh, uh, an endless inspiration for, for, for me. Um, we, we, as someone once said, we, we stand on the shoulders of, of giants and, uh, and the names that have been used today uh, are, are true giants. Um, I'm therefore really moved and touched by, by the possibility of, of being here. And I just wish it was in person in Rome. But the, the time will come when, when this can happen. I will try not to take far too long and, um, and, um, and, uh, and just give a quick uh, update of where we're coming from in the more recent past and, and where do we think um, the challenge lies, lies now. Let me have the first slide, please. And of course, uh, I'm not going to go, to go back all the way to Celi or, or uh, Grassi, uh, but I will go back to 1955, when the then Director General of WHO, uh, Marcelino Candao, in the, world, the Fifth World Health Assembly that took place in Mexico, launched the Global Malaria Eradication Program. And, um, and this uh, has to be understood um, from the point of view of the progress that had been made around the time of the, the, um, of the Malaria Commission in the League of Nations, the progress led by Italy and uh, the scientific basis of malaria control, um, uh, and the technological developments that took place around World War II. Fred Soper was um, a, a key voice in pushing for the concept of eradication, um, the Europeans generally had a, a little bit more of a reserved approach to the concept, uh, but Soper um, drove the concept forward and indeed WHO did launch the, the, the first eradication program. Of this phrase of, uh, of the Director General, I think it's important to retain uh, some concepts. One, the, the, the the belief that the tools to achieve eradication were available there and then, and here we're talking essentially of, of DDT um, and of then chloroquine, of course, that what needed to be done, the plan of what was required to eradicate malaria was known, and that therefore malaria was simply an operational implementation challenge, not a scientific uh, endeavor. And of course, without falling into the trap of historical revisionism, um, it is obvious that the tools were not enough. Uh, what needed to be done, uh, or, or rather the, the epidemiological implications uh, of trying to interrupt malaria transmission were not available, and that uh, falling into the trap of just an operational management uh, approach would be fatal. Next slide, please. 
Nonetheless, the uh, 1955 to the 1969 period, the, the 1969 being the time when formally we accept that the program was brought to a halt, did represent a lot of progress uh, in many parts of the world, less so in Africa, uh, but importantly in, 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 in many other areas. And certainly, November the 17th of 1970, Italy was certified malaria-free as uh, 14 other countries on one territory in that period of time. As well as in the longer tail, but still building from that first major push of the 1950s and 60s, another seven countries on one territory were certified malaria-free by the World Health Organization. Next slide. However, the uh, recognition already in the early 1960s that um, eradication of malaria was not achievable, the um, lack of financial resources or rather the replenishment of what was called the special account in WHO for the malaria eradication effort um, soon signaled that the effort was not going to be a successful one. And it took still a few years until 69 to formally bring it to a halt. But the consequences of this were pretty dramatic. These are some examples from uh, Joe, um, uh, Justin Cohen's paper, looking at what we've often called the valley of death, what happened once the uh, elimination efforts or the intensified elimination efforts were stopped and how malaria came back and came back with a vengeance in many different places. Uh, it is in Garki, in Taveta, in Kenya, um, in Sudan, um, in Zanzibar, or in Belize, in Brazil, in Colombia, many, many places. And this signals what happened during most of the 1970s and 80s and 90s, that malaria, uh, there was a sense of defeat, um, of failure, of a public health failure, Malaria was put out of the agenda and the malaria came back with a vengeance. Next slide. As uh, Ian McGregor, um, uh, an illustrious uh, British malariologist um, who until very recently had been leading the, the Medical Research um, um, Council Center in the Gambia uh, said, uh, when describing this period of the late 1960s, the 70s, and what was to be much of the 80s and 90s, throughout the world, support for research into malaria, even that concerned with insecticides and chemotherapeutics, contracted swiftly. Worse still, the apparent imminent demise of a once important disease removed the necessity for training scientists in malariology. It took 10 years and the war. The, the Vietnam War, to hold this tragic trend. Next slide. A good way to illustrate this is to just recognize that throughout the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, no countries were certified malaria-free. Next slide. Now, things started to change. And here I have to pay tribute to my predecessor in this position, and also uh, a Spaniard uh, and, a, and a deep uh, admirer of the Italian school, um, Pepe Najera, uh, then the director of what was called the Malaria Action Program, uh, devoted his last years uh, here at WHO to uh, instigate what was to become the first turning point in this state of abandonment, of this state of defeat. That was the Amsterdam Ministerial Conference in, the, in 1992, which developed the first major substantive document of WHO in the fight against malaria since the eradication times, the Global Strategy for Malaria Control. And truly, the 1990s became an amazing decade. Uh, the multilateral initiative in malaria on the side of the uh, first Pan-African Malaria Conference, the establishment by WHO of the Rollback Malaria Initiative, the momentous leadership by the African countries, the heads of state declaring in Abuja in the year 2000, putting squarely malaria as a public health problem and as a development problem, 
in the, the full development and economic discourse, the establishment of the UN framework for the Millennium Development Goals, including Target 6C, that specifically talk about malaria, the G8 Okinawa Summit in 2000, again, placing squarely the fight against malaria, the establishment of the Gates Foundation, all of this in the year 2000, what an amazing year, and that led then to the creation of the Global Fund in 2002. All of these have laid the foundation for these two uh, extraordinary decades that we've lived through in this uh, first part of this 21st century. But it happened, the political um, and uh, institutional um, uh, making happened in the 1990s, and it all started in Amsterdam. But in the 1990s, next slide, something else happened, which I think we often fail to recognize. Key partnerships for research and product development were established. The first one, the Malaria Vaccine Initiative, hosted at PATH, the Medicines for Malaria Venture, and eventually the European EDCTP, European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, to be followed later on by others like IVCC and um, FIND and others. But these were already established towards the latter part of the 1990s. And importantly, and I think not sufficiently recognized, the 1990s and the latter part of the 80s saw the fundamental scientific developments of the tools and strategies upon which we still operate today. Insecticide-treated bed nets from um, uh, actually uh, Phyllis Ranke in the late 1970s in Mali, but then in the 80s, the work of Chris Curtis, Pierre Carneval, and then... Um, including humbly myself and Bob Snow and, of course, Brian Greenwood, uh, and then in the 1990s established the uh, role um, as of insecticide-treated bed nets as a, a, as a highly efficacious vector control approach. The development of our emission in combination therapies also dates from the 1990s, like, just like the development of rapid diagnostic tests and uh, the revision of the use of antimalarials, not just for treatment, but also for chemo prevention. IPTP in pregnancy with SP or IPTI in infancy with SP or seasonal approaches to chemo prevention. But also the 1990s saw uh, some of the early pioneering vaccine trials. So 1990s were truly extraordinary time that laid the foundation both from the political, the financial, the institutional, as well as the research and tools basis for what was to come. Right. Next slide. And what was to come uh, needs to be understood, setting a baseline. And let us establish the baseline as the year 2000, 20 years ago. At that time, we estimate in Africa, there were about 200 million malaria cases every year. There were around 680,000 deaths, um, mostly in children. There wasn't any really significant vector control uh, being deployed. Chloroquine was the first line treatment, often used or mostly used as presumptive because uh, there was extremely limited diagnostic capacity in, in place, to, totally dependent on, on light microscopy. Uh, chloroquine resistance was already uh, notable um, and quickly spreading. There was no chemo prevention approach used in any, in any significant scale. The product pipeline of new antimalarials was very limited or of other insecticides. There wasn't significant funding. And the population of Sub-Saharan Africa at that point was of about 665 million people. Next slide. Nearly 20 years later, and uh, if, if I could have done this uh, presentation 10 days from now, I could give you all the fully updated numbers, but believe me, they don't really change a lot. But 20 years later, we have about 200 million cases, 215 million uh, cases of, of malaria. So... Not a huge difference, as we'll have time to reflect in just a minute. We now have about 384,000 deaths in sub-Saharan Africa. But what has dramatically changed is that 
now about 200 million uh, LLINs, long-lasting insecticide-treated nets, get distributed every year. Around 135 million people are protected by IRS. Around 300 million new ACT courses are distributed every year. Rapid diagnostic tests are widely available. Targeted interventions for highest risk groups like IPTP, IPTI, and SMC are taking place. There's an amazing pipeline of diagnostics, drugs, vaccines, delivery strategies, and innovative vector control tools. Endemic countries, together with mechanisms like the Global Fund and USA PMI, disburse in excess of $3 billion every year for malaria control. And the population of sub-Saharan Africa has increased to more than 1.1 billion people. So what an amazing change that has taken place in these 20 years. Next slide. So to put a few numbers more of what has happened in these last two decades, in excess of $39 billion have been invested in malaria response, of which around $26 billion come from external sources. And the three billions that we invest per year are, however, um, only about half of what we estimate would be needed for optimal malaria control. The number of insecticide-treated nets delivered globally over the last two decades is more than 2.5 billion bed nets. The number of households or the percentage of households that have at least one ITN has gone from being less than 5% to more than 65%. The percent of children under the age of five, and pregnant women, by the way, sleeping under an ITN in sub-Saharan Africa has gone from 3% to more than 50%. The number of children protected with SMC in sub-Saharan Africa has gone from a few, a uh, couple of hundred thousand to more than 20 million every year. The percent of women receiving three or more doses of IPT has gone from 2% to 34%, still very short. And the number of RDTs and ACTs delivered is in excess of 2.7 and 3.1 billion, respectively. This is an amazing public health story. What has the impact been? Next slide. The impact is that in these first 20 years of the century, we have averted, in a, we, the countries have averted in excess of 1.5 billion malaria cases and 7.6 million deaths. And more than 80 or 90% of them have actually happened in the African region. Few would argue that the fight against malaria over these two decades has been one of the biggest returns of, on, on, on investment in global health since the beginning of the millennium. Next slide. In 2015, the world adopted the new global technical strategy to take us from 2016 to 2030 with these goals to reduce disease and death and eliminate malaria and prevent the establishment of transmission with targets for 2030 that are actually aligned with sustainable development goals and, and five-year milestones. Specifically for 2020, the expectation that we would have reduced malaria morbidity and mortality by at least 40%. Next slide. Now, where are we now? Next slide. WHO releases every year a, a, a malaria report, the key tool to track progress. Since 2017, we've been signaling out or noticing and calling out that the fight is not progressing well. 2017, we said we are at a crossroads. 2018, we said um, uh, we need to get back on track because we're off track. 2019, we called, we have to focus on the high burden countries. And next slide, why that? Because following a period of uh, great progress, the last three, four years have seen a flattening in the progression. In some cases, number of cases coming up again. And that's what the left figure shows in terms of absolute number of cases. And the right figure shows in terms of incidence rates. Next slide. And that's true for cases. And that is also true for deaths, which is what these two figures show. Next slide. Why are we seeing this flattening? Well, probably... Uh, the fact that we have an unfinished agenda. On the one hand, there are funding gaps. We're clearly not at the level where we should be in terms of funding needs. 
Secondly, there are coverage gaps, even though the scale of uh, deployment is unprecedented, we are still short of where we would nearly clearly need to be. Still, children are uh, not protected with an effective vector control tool. Still, a good number of malaria cases go undiagnosed and treated. Still, 15 million pregnant women do not get one single dose of IPTP. Thirdly, we face biological challenges, insecticide resistance, antimalarial drug resistance, um, emergence of parasites that have deletions for the key protein used in rapid diagnostic tests, the HRP2 deletion. And the fourth one now, with invading new uh, anophelin species, particularly Stephen's eye, an urban malaria vector coming in through the Horn of Africa. Next slide. So in summary, We've made amazing progress, but the last few years we have flattened out. We are plateauing. We have stopped making progress. We're not going beyond where we got five, four or five years ago. Now, on the elimination space, there are, however, some good news. Elimination meaning the interruption of local malaria transmission in, of, uh, of malaria parasites in a defined geographical area, usually countries specifically. Next slide. In this space, WHO launched the framework for malaria elimination uh, um, uh, in 2017 with the uh, aim of supporting countries move forward. Next slide. And uh, what we have seen over the past few years is the number of countries coming close to elimination ha does ha not stop to increase. In the yellow top line, that's a number of countries that are now with less than 10,000 cases per year, somehow an arbitrary figure. In blue, the bottom line, the number of cases countries with less than 10 country, with less than 10 cases. Now, more than half of the malaria endemic countries are within reach of elimination. And of course, the ultimate achievement is, as we celebrate now also the 50 years of China, of India of Italy being certified malaria free, is what you see here. Um, uh, uh, countries being certified uh, uh, malaria uh, free. Next slide. We also created what we've called the E2020, the 20 country, one countries that could achieve uh, interruption of malaria transmission uh, by 2020. And overall, we will have achieved at least 10 countries to have fully interrupted malaria transmission. Um, and these include countries such as China, um, Iran, um, Algeria, um, uh, Belize, Paraguay, El Salvador, um, and others. Next slide. So in this period of renewed activity, 11 countries have been certified malaria-free. The latest ones have been Paraguay, the first country in the Americas since the early 1970s, um, Uzbekistan, um, Argentina, and uh, also a um, um, uh, couple of years ago, or a year and a half ago, Algeria, the first country in the WHO Afro region to have been certified malaria-free since the 1970s. Next slide. The last few years have also seen um, re-establishment of the discussion of eradication what uh, many termed the E-word that no one wanted to talk about, given still the, the, the sense of failure of the first attempt in the 1950s. But as many of you will recall, in 2007, the Gates Foundation, um, and Bill and Melinda called for malaria eradication. Um, and this has generated an ongoing debate. Next slide. We often forget that the so-called and that the 1969 resolution that we often mention brought uh, uh, the first eradication program to a halt um, had given up on eradication. And it is actually not exactly the case. The 1969 resolution, um, um, uh, as it reads there, says, complete eradication of malaria from the world remains a primary task of national public health organizations, and that even in the regions where eradication does not yet seem feasible, control of malaria with the means available should be encouraged and may be regarded as a necessary step and valid 
towards the ultimate goal, ultimate goal of eradication. Couple of things to retain. One, WHO, since 1955, has never given up on the goal of eradication. Two, it recognizes that the way to get there is effective control of the disease. And pretty much that's where WHO still sits. Next slide. And I'm coming to an end. Um, in Five years ago, four years ago, as, as the debate was um, uh, very agitated about wanting to establish a date for malaria eradication, the Director General of WHO at that time, Margaret Chan, asked me, let's put together a high-level group that looks at, um, at the benefits, at the future scenarios and feasibility of malaria eradication. The summary of this has now been published. You can access it in a very nice book. I wish I had been able with you to be in, in, in Rome and given you some specific copies. Next slide. Um, but the, the bottom line is uh, eradication remains the ultimate vision for WHO. We have not stepped back from that. However, we believe, as the, in many ways the 1969 declaration says, that many things need to happen on the path. We need new and improved tools, which are the product of research and development. We need to improve health services, and that speaks to universal health coverage. We need improved data based on surveillance and response. We need greater community engagement, and we need subnational and national and regional strategies. And only once we're able to progress that line, we will be coming closer to um, controlling effectively malaria and potentially seeing the future eradication. But today, WHO does not uh, stand by establishing a given date within which eradication could be achieved. Next slide. And this with, this, with this, I, I will finish. Um, next week, on Monday, we launch our uh, 2020 World Malaria Report. Um, a World Malaria Report that's a special one because it looks at the last 20 years also of our global fight against malaria, the great progress that has been made, but the massive challenges that we continue to, to undertake. The future uh, will depend on our capacity, as the Italian school did uh, 150 years ago, apply science, apply knowledge, and translate that science and knowledge to public health. There is still a lot to be done. And to take malaria as a problem to be solved, as Celi did and Grassi did and Coluzzi did, it's a problem to be solved. It's not simply a task to be performed. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the presentation. This was a great way to see how progress has been done and how challenges need to be faced. And the message that malaria defeat is not forever, whenever it's accomplished, I think it's a very important message. Uh, today we celebrate uh, the elimination of malaria from Italy. Uh, I think the message should be that also in this case, we should never give it for granted. Um, in Italy, malaria has been eliminated, but luckily, malariologists are still alive uh, and needed, I think. And this is the way for me to introduce uh, uh, Donatella Taramelli, professor at the University of Milano, who is directing the uh, Italian Malaria Network for uh, the, next, uh, uh, the next presentation. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome, Donatella, for your uh, presentation. Thank, thank you, Pietro. Can you hear me? Yes. And thank you, Pedro, for your nice, very nice presentation and introduction to the, to the talk. Yes, I'm, I'm here as a um, director. <laughs> of the um, Italian Malaria Network. If I, if I can have the previous slide, please. And the, net, the network uh, is, can be considered a virtual Italian Malaria Research Institute that was uh, legally uh, signed in 2010, but in fact, 
the idea came to Professor Paolo Arese in 2006, and the idea was to put together all the small groups of uh, Italian malariologists and combine them in, in a network. And uh, I, you can see in the next slide that the network uh, at present is uh, um, constituted of 12 different Italian universities, and uh, including uh, then, uh, on top of that, the Istituto Superiore di Sanità. And uh, in the next slide, uh, the um, Italian universities, you can see, uh, and the small groups that constitute the network are distributed in different cities in Italy. And uh, the idea the, the, is, was uh, of Professor um, Arese, and it's to continues to be our idea, is to collaborate um, in order to get uh, um, even a critical mass you know, to, to, to do better science and also to be able to compete at international and national levels for, for funding. And the second big um, idea aims of our groups is uh, of train new scientists, new malariologists, in order not to um, interrupt the tradition of, uh, um, of good and excellent research in malaria that was uh, um, done in Italy before. And uh, um, within, in the next slide, you can see that within the, the groups, uh, there are different uh, specialities and expertise and uh, um, groups are mostly, um, some groups are working on chemistry and um, phytochemistry, so they do provide the new compounds to be tested as new antimalarials, but they also do provide, um, I would say, the, the reagents and tools for the, the, the scientists to be used for the research. And then we have groups working on the basic biology of uh, studies on parasite and vectors, both molecular and genomic and proteomic studies. And we have the groups uh, working on the, the post-parasite interaction, uh, both from the experimental point of view and uh, um, clinics. So uh, in total, I think we have, in the next slide, we do have more than 100 um, young um, researchers and that contribute to um, this network of malariologists and I think this really was the idea of our predecessors to continue a good school of Italian malariologists and this is also the idea of Professor Arese that you, this, uh, you see um, on top on the top left of the slide with the, the red uh, Sweden and he is the emeritus uh, president of this uh, group and I think he's present in the audience so I would like to thank him um, a lot for his uh, um, for sightseeing the possibility of uh, continuing good malaria research and uh, in Italy and collaborate and have all this group collaborating together and also collaborating in uh, with group in Europe. And, uh, and in fact, has been the collaboration with the group in Europe uh, has been really um, helping us to meet a lot of people, including <laughs> Professor Alonso, and also to meet um, the next speaker that uh, I'm going to present it now, and which is uh, uh, Professor Kelly Cibali. And in fact, if I can have next slide, um, Professor. Kelly Cibali, uh, well, I met him, Kelly, um, more than 10 years ago when we were part of the, um, part of the Antimal project financed by the European community. The project was uh, um, coordinated by um, Professor Steve Ward of the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And uh, several groups of the Italian Malaria Network did participate to that uh, um, integrated project, and other groups participated to the Biomalpar Excellence Project. So Kelly is now here. I'm pleased to introduce him. He's professor of organic chemistry at the University of Cape Town. And he's also the director of the Drug Discovery and Development Center in Cape Town, South Africa. And um, I think it is a really a demonstration of how um, excellent research 
can be done uh, in Africa. He traveled, although he studied abroad, he, he got his PhD in, uh, in Cambridge, you know? and, uh, um, and then um, he moved as a postdoc at the University of Liverpool and then in the States, but now he's back in, uh, in, the, in his country since several years, and this in fact, uh, not only the director of the Drug Discovery and Development Center, but that if I lost one important thing I lost, which I have noticed that last year I read, he has been named one of the world's top 60 most inspirational leaders in the pharmaceutical industry. So I'm very pleased that uh, to introduce him and also to um, Please, that the Italian Malaria Network was able to collaborate with him and with many other groups all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Donatella. Thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, and thank you to Donatella uh, and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to, um, to speak to you um, today. Um, I just have one regret. Um, when Pietro Alano invited me to this meeting, it was actually meant to be in Rome. It was meant to be a face-to-face -face meeting. So I'm very disappointed that um, this is happening online. Of course, um, I'm not blaming my Italian colleagues. I blame COVID-19, this uh, stupid virus that has prevented me from enjoying my spaghetti and macaroni um, that I was looking forward to enjoying in Rome. But anyway, I'm sure that will be for another occasion. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is the outline of my, my presentation. So as you saw from the title, this is about discovering the next generation of medicines from an area that will have an impact on the elimination agenda that we heard about from uh, uh, Pedro Alonso in the previous presentation. So I'll kick off on the very first slide and just remind you and give you a, a very brief overview of the profile of medicines that are likely to have an impact on eliminating malaria. Then I'm going to give you one example, just one example of the many examples I could give you of a program of a molecule that has this profile um, that really shows us what is possible. And then thirdly, I'm going to describe to you how this compound works, because when we initially identified it, we didn't know how it worked. We didn't know the mode of action or the target. And so I'll give you um, a very brief outline of how we undertook the mode of action deconvolution, which then provided a basis for undertaking a drug discovery program, which I will mention at the end, that is now focusing on going after this gene family of targets that are really very exciting from the perspective of delivering new medicines that have potential impact to, uh, on malaria elimination. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. All right, I will spend probably a couple of minutes uh, or so on this slide. So what you will see is the life cycle of the malaria parasite. And on your right-hand side uh, of the diagram, you will see the picture of a mosquito. Basically, that's illustrating how malaria, the disease, is acquired when a female Anopheles mosquito, of course, during a blood meal, injects these parasites, the sporozoids. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. And then on your left, your extreme left, what you will see is a mosquito transmitting the disease through transmission of the parasite. So these are the two extremes that I'd like you to focus on. One is how malaria is acquired when the parasites are um, really injected into the bloodstream by the uh, female Anopheles mosquito during the blood meal, 
and eventually how the same parasite then propagates the infection by spreading it. So back to the release of parasites from the female Anopheles mosquito during a blood meal. So the first port of call for the parasite from the blood eventually gets into the liver. So the liver is the first port of call. And of course, as those of us in the field know that the clinical symptoms of malaria are not evident at the liver stage. From a medicine perspective, if we kill the parasites when they are in the liver, then we can potentially offer protection. And so that's the first profile of new medicines for malaria. The first is to potentially kill the parasite when they're in the liver. I'm taking you through this life cycle to your left, to your right, and the next stage is what you see on the diagram as Plasmodium vivax dormant stage. So the malaria caused by Plasmodium vivax, the majority of the cases, particularly in Africa, are caused by Plasmodium fasciborum. But the malaria caused by Plasmodium vivax, one of the things that happen before the parasites infect the red blood cells is they go into a dormant form. And this dormant form is what is typically responsible for relapses. And we call these dormant forms hypnozoids. And so these are really the, the ones that are really responsible for malaria relapses after somebody has not even been exposed to malaria or been in a malaria area for a long time. So if we kill those dormant forms of the parasite, plasmodium vivax, then potentially we could combat. If you further along the life cycle and get to when the parasites migrate from the liver and infect the human red blood cells, that's when the clinical symptoms of the disease become evident. And clearly, if we kill the so-called asexual blood stage parasites, we can, of course, relieve clinical symptoms of the disease and cure malaria. But it doesn't stop there. So what happens at this stage is that when the parasites are in the red blood cells, we have two types of reproduction. On one hand, we have the asexual reproduction, which is the one that's really depicted here that happens over uh, a period of about 48 hours. And then of course we see the clinical symptoms of the disease. The other type of reproduction is the sexual reproduction that also occurs in the human host. And then during that process of sexual reproduction, these parasites we call gametocytes, or in other words, for the layman. So these are the transmissible forms of the parasite. Therefore, if we kill off those parasites, we prevent the mosquito during the next blood meal to then transmit mosquito from one person to the next. So in summary, what this diagram is showing you is that in order to contribute to malaria elimination, clearly blocking transmission is an important property that we need to see in the next generation of malaria medicines in addition to the other, of course, desirable properties. Can I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. So this is just an example of one of our many programs where we've identified a chemical series or a molecule that has given us the data showing very clearly that it kills the parasite at multiple stages. In other words, it has the profile that I just described on the previous slide of killing the parasite at multiple stages of its life cycle and showing us the potential not only to prevent or cure malaria, but also potentially to interrupt 
transmission of malaria in regions, which of course, as Pedro Alonso described, is what we define as elimination. Next slide, please. So this is just uh, for those of you who uh, uh, really um, like to see the data. So, so this is some of the data that we have on the compound. I don't want to labor the point here. Uh, we have activity both on the asexual forms of the parasite, but also activity on the different liver stages, as you see here, but also activity in terms of blocking transmission of the parasites. This work was actually published uh, back in um, 2017, and you will see the details of uh, this data in the publication that's shown on, on this slide. Now, if I can have the next slide. At this point in the program, we didn't know how this compound worked. We knew it was giving us the attractive profile that we were looking for. So obviously the attractiveness of the profile really, really got us excited about what we could do to understand exactly what is the mode of action so that we can learn from what this molecule is doing once we understand what it does. So this that you'll see on the next slide is the mode of action deconvolution, which was about identifying the biological target that we think is being interfered with and therefore giving us the phenotype that we see in terms of killing the parasite at multiple stages. So this target, again, to cut long story short before I tell you how we identify it, is basically a kinase, a lipid kinase we call phosphatidylinositol-4 kinase, or PI4K. How did we identify this target? If I can have the next slide. We took two complementary approaches. One was genomic approach, where we subjected the parasites to drug pressure until we begin to see resistance emerging. We then sequenced the mutants that were generated from the, the process of raising resistant mutants. And then we looked for genetic polymorphisms and we saw very clearly mutations, specifically single nucleotide polymorphisms in the gene encoding for plasmodium falciparum PI4K. We also did a separate complementary target identification approach of using proteomics, which also beautifully, beautifully nailed down PI4K as the target of, of our compound. We also did, as you will see on the next slide, um, really trying to see whether there was a correlation between the ability of this compound to inhibit this PI4K enzyme from the parasites and this ability to kill the parasites. And that's exactly what we saw. We saw a very nice correlation between the ability of this compound to inhibit this target and also killing the parasite. Next slide, please. And this was also something that was done by our colleagues in uh, at Novartis who published this paper earlier on before we did. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. All right, so the background I've given you was of a small molecule that gave us the desired profile of having mouth stage activity. I also showed you how we deconvoluted the mode of action of that small molecule. We understood what the target was for that compound. In addition to that work and work that we have done additionally and what other people have done in the community, there have been a number of kind of targets in the malaria parasites, as well as new chemotypes that have been identified since this work was conducted. And I think the evidence that's accumulated in the literature is that the, this malaria parasite kinases, this gene family of, of enzymes or proteins, are really essential at multiple stages of the parasite life cycle. And what you see on the right-hand side is a little table that was extracted from uh, a perspective that we published uh, a few years ago, uh, showing some of the kinases that have been validated as interesting drug targets that are expressed 
at multiple stages during the last life cycle of the parasite. Can I have the next slide, please? So what we've done as the focus of our current program, in addition to many other programs that I'm not going to describe to you today, is we've identified two starting points for our drug discovery program that is guided by our understanding of the mode of action of our initial compound that we identified with the profile that we are looking for that could potentially contribute to malaria elimination. So the first one on to your left is the kinase I just described to you that we implicated in the mode of action of the compound that I showed you before. The one on the right hand side is another kinase, this cycling guanosine monophosphate dependent protein kinase or PKG, which is also, as you will see a little bit later, is also expressed in multiple stages of the parasite life cycle. In order to be able to do target-based drug discovery, we often need to benefit from the structure of the protein that's available. In the case of PI4K, the structure is not available, but there are homology models that have been constructed, including ones that we've actually constructed, based on the similarity of the parasite enzyme in comparison to the human equivalent. The structure of PKG is available, so we can use this information to design molecules that could be developed as medicines for malaria that have a real potential to contribute to the malaria elimination. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, next slide again. So what we're doing really uh, in conclusion regarding the approach that we're taking using these two protein kinases as examples is that we are focusing on repositioning human kinase inhibitors, especially those from the cancer field. The other approach that we're using to find new starting points for drug discovery is we're doing high throughput screening using DNA encoded libraries, which has already delivered for us new chemotypes that we are pushing through the drug discovery process. If I can have the next slide, please. All right, so this is my final scientific slide and I'm just trying to really put a context to why we selected PI4K. And I told you before, PI4K really, really came out of us trying to understand the profile of that compound that I described earlier. And PKG, of course, other people have done substantial work showing that this is also an essential target that's been validated to a large extent. And you can see that both proteins are really expressed during the entire life cycle of the parasite, which makes them really attractive targets for basing drug discovery programs on looking for new drugs and medicines that have an impact across the entire life cycle, including blocking transmission of the infection. That was the final scientific slide. If I can just have the next two slides for acknowledgements. So this is just really thanking the entire team that was involved in that compound that I showed you as an example, that went in fact as far as phase two human clinical trials. This is really a program supported very generously by Medicines for Malaria Venture. So tremendous thanks to MMV for the tremendous support and collaboration over the last uh, 11 years. And then to the next slide as well uh, is acknowledgements to a number of people that are involved in the, the kindness program that we are doing uh, here in Cape Town. Uh, very special thanks to Lauren Arense, uh, who is the enzymologist really driving the, the drug discovery process in terms of taking setting up the biochemical assays and characterizing these enzymes that we're working on. Very grateful to the funders that are listed here. Uh, and of course, without them, we cannot do the work uh, that we do. And finally, the picture that you see on the next slide is a, a picture um, of Cape Town. So this is not wrong, this is Cape Town. And I leave you with that image um, of, of Cape Town. We don't have pasta, we don't have spaghetti, but we have a mountain and two oceans. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Carly, for this trip uh, in uh, drug discovery, fascinating and promising. 
And uh, uh, before introducing the next speakers, I would like to briefly summarize uh, um, the malaria research uh, in, uh, in Sapienza University, following up what uh, the presentation by uh, the director of uh, Sapienza University. If I may have the slides, please. Okay, and uh, starting from the malariological school who has been already uh, uh, reminded by Pedro and uh, by our rector and shifting to, to uh, um, from, from these uh, uh, giants to more recent times, I think uh, talking about malariology in recent times in Sapienza, it's uh, um, like uh, talking about Coluzzi, uh, Professor Coluzzi, its uh, collaborator and its legacy. And um, I, I am sure that uh, at least a uh, part of you is familiar with Colucci work and its uh, contribution in the malaria entomology, uh, starting with the analysis of polyton chromosomes and to the, of uh, anophelin vectors, leading to the first genetic tool uh, to um, identify uh, sibling species, uh, which means uh, morphological identical species uh, with a different uh, uh, relevance in uh, uh, malaria transmission. And uh, because of his uh, seminal contribution in malaria entomology, uh, uh, one year after his death, uh, one of the major uh, anopheles uh, uh, species uh, uh, vectors in Afrotropical region was named, uh, recently discovered following up his, uh, his uh, seminal studies, was named after him as Anopheles Coluzzi. And this also started a, a, a very uh, important field of the genomics of uh, anophelin vectors uh, from the first uh, um, uh, genome, published genome in 2002, to much more uh, um, ambitious project uh, uh, on uh, the population genomics of these uh, species, which uh, are uh, meant to receive, uh, to, to produce new tools for, for controlling these mosquitoes and uh, for, for studying their, their biology, their interaction with the parasite and, uh, and uh, optimize control approaches. Um, but uh, Coluzzi contribution in the field of malaria was not only uh, focused on research, but also on capacity building. I think it's uh, uh, safe, I'm on the safe side to, to specify that Coluzzi uh, as a, um, one of, was one of the first research in Europe to uh, believe in a new generation of African scientists and in contributing to the creation of institution like those that I'm, uh, um, there in these slides, uh, which uh, became after several years, uh, big, institution with independent researchers, which are reference for any malaria study in, uh, in West Africa. And you can see on the um, left part of the slides uh, the, how the, the starting point of the institution uh, in Mali when uh, Coluzzi was there for the first time. And uh, in addition to this uh, great contribution, uh, uh, he also established very good relationship with the populations uh, where he was carrying out his, uh, um, his uh, um, studies on, on malaria vectors. And of course, he left uh, a big legacy. And uh, uh, to, to not, to, today in, uh, in uh, Sapienza University, there are several uh, trainees uh, uh, by Coluzzi, who uh, are um, involved in different kind of studies uh, uh, concerning malaria, from parasite vector interaction to parasite human interaction, to the host history of medicine, as well as uh, to uh, malaria entomology, following up the, the path that uh, Coluzzi um, started. And uh, his legacy uh, is not only uh, limited to people who uh, still are uh, working at, at the research group in Sapienza University, but also uh, out of research uh, of uh, Sapienza University. I think there are many, many more than the one that I could list here. Uh, people who were inspired and trained by, by Coluzzi and are now their own research group are either in different uh, universities in Italy or in different international institu institutions. And among these people, there is Flaminia Caterruccia, the next uh, speaker. She uh, was graduated in Italy, in Sapienza University, and as a first short postdoc, and she was a chemist um, as a background, 
and uh, she had her first contact with the malaria world in uh, uh, Coluzzi group immediately after her graduation. She then moved to Imperial College in uh, uh, Andrea Crisanti group for several years, uh, continuing uh, uh, work on uh, malaria vectors and more recently moved to uh, Harvard University and uh, where she's producing uh, uh, very original, new and, in, and fascinating results uh, and uh, potential tools to control uh, anopheles vectors and, uh, and malaria transmission. So I, I leave the floor to Flaminia, who is going to talk about breaking up the plasmodium cycles. Uh, I, I don't have the title anymore, but I think, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but I think Flaminia can easily follow up. Thank you, Flaminia. Um, well, thank you, uh, Ale, for this very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I guess you can hear me. Um, so, uh, and also thank you to the organizers for uh, um, for the invitation to join this uh, symposium. Um, as uh, Alessandra uh, mentioned, I grew up in Rome and I took my first step in the uh, field of malaria research at the Sapienza University in Rome, where I was really inspired by uh, the example of the um, uh, Roman School of Malariology. And so uh, I'm really thrilled and honored to be uh, here joining these celebrations for the 50th, 50th anniversary of malaria um, elimination in, in Italy. And so I'll, and I'll tell you about some of the work that we're doing in my lab in Boston on how we can use basic biology of uh, mosquito parasite interactions to uh, possibly and hopefully identify novel ways that we can block the transmission cycle and contribute to malaria eliminations in, in other countries. So if I can have the next slide. Um, so uh, as uh, Pedro mentioned, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so um, malaria has been uh, with, with us, with humans, for, for a very, very long time. And this map shows uh, how uh, all the regions that were afflicted by malaria until the beginning of the last century. And in purple are the regions that are still currently affected by malaria, which is mostly tropical and subtropical countries. So malaria was eliminated from large parts of the world, uh, including uh, Italy. And uh, the next slide uh, shows um, which were the tools uh, that were used um, with the malaria elimination campaign starting in the 40s and 50s based on uh, targeting the mosquito vector um, via uh, the elimination of uh, the uh, larval breeding sites, um, but also with the use uh, of uh, insecticides. DDT had just been discovered as a potent um, insecticidal compound and was used to spray house walls and, and kill uh, mosquitoes inside people's homes. And, and also these strategies were, uh, were um, flanked by the use of uh, quinine, so antimalarials to cure uh, people. And so these uh, strategies were really uh, instrumental in eliminating malaria from large parts of the world. However, in the next slide, if we moved uh, 80 years uh, down the line, um, we still are fighting malaria and we're still using the same tools. We're still using insecticides, uh, now uh, mostly delivered via mosquito nets, um, which is the, sing the single most important tool that we have for malaria elimination. And also in the next slide, we obviously still use uh, drugs um, to cure people uh, at the moment. We're using combinations of drugs based on artemisinin uh, and uh, partner drugs. And so combined insecticides and uh, drugs uh, have really contributed in this century in the, the decrease in malaria cases that we, we've seen. Uh, however, as, as Pedro um, talked, uh, talked about earlier, uh, in the last few years, malaria cases have sort of uh, stalled. And uh, if we can move to the next slide, and this is, as Pedro identified, is mostly due, uh, I mean, it's due to a combination of reasons, but uh, mostly due to uh, biological reasons, um, including resistance. So uh, mosquitoes uh, are becoming resistant to the function of insecticides. They're not killed uh, anymore, which means that mosquito nets um, are not as effective as they used to be. Um, and similarly, uh, plasmodium parasites are also becoming resistant to um, artemisinin-based combination uh, therapies. And uh, we do have new insecticides. We do have new uh, promising drugs uh, coming up, as uh, Kelly just uh, showed us. So these are these are the good news. 
However, it's also likely that uh, both uh, these uh, tools at some point, uh, after a period of uh, uh, success, will also undergo um, reduced effectiveness as seen with the current insecticides and drugs. So we definitely need uh, innovation. Uh, we need innovation in the field of malaria control to help uh, current strategies and to uh, achieve uh, elimination um, in uh, other parts of the world. So uh, in my lab, in the next slide, um, that's, uh, we are thinking a lot about how we can uh, innovate. And uh, we start from basic biology of mosquito-parasite uh, interactions. So we study how uh, the mosquito transmits uh, malaria parasites that are developing in, in their um, in their migas. And we do these studies both in our lab in Boston, but also a very important component of our program is done in collaboration with scientists from malaria endemic regions, um, mostly in Burkina Faso. And um, so our, the, our approach is trying to come up with new strategies that will uh, not face the same issues of resistance in mosquitoes and, uh, and in parasites. And so um, uh, today I'm excited to present some of the uh, data that we have on a new uh, project that we have, we have been working on for the past uh, three years, where we are aiming at uh, blocking the transmission cycle in ways that are safe and also effective and will not uh, induce, or at least will delay the, uh, the, the uh, generation of resistance. And so if I can have the next slide. Um, so if I can bring you back to uh, our current uh, malaria tools, so uh, we kill mosquitoes uh, with uh, using insecticides, and those insecticides are um, uh, impregnated on mosquito nets. And so what happens is that when a mosquito lands uh, on the net, then um, the insecticide will be absorbed through the mosquito legs, and the mosquito will be killed in a short uh, time. And this, as you can imagine, imposes very strong and selective pressures on those mosquitoes to develop uh, resistance to the function of the insecticides. And that's one of the reasons why bed nets are not as effective as they used to be. And in, in people, instead, uh, we kill parasites using drugs. So if I can have the next slide. Um, our idea is a simple idea. Like, what if we merged uh, these two strategies? What if we exposed mosquitoes to antimalarials to cure them of malaria parasites? so that a mosquito could absorb those uh, uh, antimalarials once uh, uh, in touch with the, with the net, but the parasite will be killed. But the mosquito itself would not be affected because the drugs are specific to, uh, to parasites. So in this way, we would not induce um, a resistant mechanism uh, in the mosquito. And for resistance in the parasites, I'll tell you in, an, in, a, few, in a few slides. So uh, we started this project uh, in the next slide um, about uh, three years ago, and a brilliant postdoc in the lab, Doug Payton, who's a real expert uh, in mosquito uh, biology, uh, started uh, leading this project and really led it by himself until uh, very recently when he was joined by two uh, very talented uh, graduate uh, students, Ali Probst and Ezra Du, in my lab. And so, uh, next slide. What uh, uh, the Doug has been doing, so the experiment, experimental scheme is on the left here. So Doug uh, chose to use uh, atovacun as a proof of principle. So atovacun is a, is a drug, very potent anti-malarial drug, and it's also highly uh, lipophilic, uh, which means that we thought that it might have a high probability of being taken up by, uh, by the mosquito by, uh, by the legs because the mosquito is covered by a, a waxy a cuticle that is um, quite lipophilic. And so uh, the scheme on the left shows a, a tawakon coated on a surface in green and a mosquito uh, sitting on, on this surface. So Doug allows these mosquitoes to sit for a couple of minutes on the surface, so to take up the drug. And then a few uh, minutes later, he infects uh, these mosquitoes with plasmodium falciparum parasites the most deadly form of malaria. And then after a few days, he goes and dissects the guts, uh, the meat guts in this mosquito to look for parasites. What happened to those parasites? Are they still alive or are they killed? And in the middle, you see uh, the graph showing the, the, the data, and I promise I won't show you much data today, but so uh, the graph of the data shows that um, mosquitoes that are exposed to a token have zero parasites. So we see no parasites in, in those mosquitoes. And um, so uh, parasite development is completely abolished uh, if mosquitoes are exposed to atovacone. 
while control mosquitoes are, are in gray on the left uh, are highly infected and pretty much every single mosquito is infected as shown by the pie charts at the bottom showing the prevalence of infection. So this is very effective. Parasite development is completely abolished and also using very tiny uh, amount of atolacone, so very powerful. And these data were published uh, last year. And um, so this is important proof of principle that this strategy could work, that we could expose mosquitoes to antimalarials and cure them of, of parasites. Um, but I should stress at this point that this is really proof of principle. Uh, we don't want to use atovacone on mosquito nets. Uh, atovacone is an antimalarial that is used as a prophylactic drug uh, present. And so uh, we wouldn't want to endanger its possible use by uh, putting it on all band nets. But uh, in spite of this, this is like a, a, a promising a promising strategy for, for malaria control. And what about the uh, mosquito? If I can move to the next slide. Um, mosquitoes don't seem to be affected by the drug. So in terms of survival and in terms of reproduction, they are as fit as their uh, control uh, females. So which uh, suggests that the drug is really specific, killing plasmodium parasites and does not really harm the mosquito, which is, is important to notice because it would mean that the mosquitoes would not uh, be uh, under pressure to develop resistance uh, mechanisms against uh, this, this uh, function of, of the drug. Uh, so um, solving one of, one of the issues that insecticides uh, obviously have. And so um, we've, uh, in the next slide, I'll show you like that we've uh, modeled uh, our results in the lab um, in a malaria uh, model of transmission dynamics in collaboration with our colleague, uh, colleagues in the epidemiology department, Caroline Bucky and uh, Lauren Childs, who's now at Virginia Tech. And the question that we, we asked is, what if we put antimalarials on mosquito uh, nets in, in across different parts of Africa? What will be the effect on malaria prevalence in, in those regions? And the, the model shows that uh, in both West and East Africa, adding antimalarials on the mosquito nets would uh, strongly decrease the prevalence in those, um, in those regions, um, and especially in areas where insecticide resistance is uh, very strong. Um, so, which this is obviously a mathematical model, it's not real. Oops, Ali, I think I can hear you in the background. Um, but so the um, still is quite promising because it suggests that this could be something uh, functional, uh, uh, something that could be moved uh, to field applications. And so, um, um, in, in the next slide, uh, I show that. So in order for, for this to be moved to field applications, however, um, this strategy has to work um, uh, in mosquitoes that are populating uh, the, the uh, malaria endemic areas. And as I mentioned earlier, those populations are highly resistant to the function of insecticides. So they're not killed anymore by insecticides. And so it's, um, um, the, it is possible in principle that the mechanisms that mosquitoes use to detoxify those insecticides could also detoxify the drug and so rendering it um, uh, inactive. So this is something that is important to test and is work that we are doing with our collaborators from uh, Burkina Faso, Abdullah Diabate and Thierry Lefebvre. And also, obviously, this strategy has to work uh, uh, against parasites, plasmonium falciparum parasites, that are currently circulating in malaria endemic regions. And ideally, uh, it should work also against parasites that are resistant to human therapeutics, like um, artemisinin resistant parasites. And this is work that we are doing in collaborations with um, uh, Thierry and Diabate, but also with Diane Wirth uh, and her group at Harvard, Selena Bob and Sarah Faltman. So in the next slide, we tested then uh, Atovacon in insecticide resistant mosquitoes on the left and against artemisinin resistant parasites on the right. And what you can see is that atorocrine is 100% uh, successful at eliminating parasites uh, in, in, in those mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes on the left are highly resistant to um, insecticides. There are mosquitoes from Burkina Faso that are not, are not killed by parasroids, uh, insecticides used on, on mosquito nets. And still, even in those mosquitoes, atorocrine is 100% effective at killing malaria parasites. While on the right, um, I show uh, parasites from uh, um, from uh, um, Cambodia, which are highly resistant to artemisinin, and still uh, those parasites 
uh, while when they are exposed uh, in the mosquito to atorcon, they are completely uh, abolished, which is somehow um, uh, was somehow uh, expected because the mechanisms of artemisinin and atorcon are different. However, it was very nice uh, to see. And also this uh, leads to the next idea in the next slide, um, which uh, this strategy could be also used to delay uh, the emergence and the spread of uh, resistance in parasites, so drug resistance in parasites. Because if you can imagine uh, like a parasite that is exposed to a certain drug in, in people, um, like ACTs or other combinations of drugs, um, and becomes resistant to those drugs, then if this parasite is taken up by a mosquito on the right, but is exposed to a different drug or a different combination of, of drugs, um, then the, the chances that this parasite will become resistant also to the, the second combination of drugs will be very slim and the other way around moving from the mosquito back to humans. And so uh, in a way, this is what we refer to as uh, mos human um, versus mosquito uh, combination uh, therapy, where we could attack uh, the parasites and, and from different angles, both in humans with some drugs and in, par in mosquitoes with other drugs, so that the chances of parasites re developing resistance will be, um, will be minimized and we would extend the lifespan of our best uh, control uh, tools. And so uh, to uh, make this uh, a reality, uh, what is it that we need? We obviously need new, new drugs that can work uh, in against mosquito stages of parasite development. And so in the next slide, um, I show where we are uh, right now. So we are working with our collaborators uh, from MMV, Jeremy Burroughs, uh, also with Diane Wirth at Harvard, and Janet Rodriguez uh, and her colleagues at GSK, and Elizabeth Winkler at Malda. Um, where we can use their vast uh, libraries of antimalarial compounds and test them and screen them for uh, their effect effectiveness uh, uh, against parasites in mosquito stages. And so we are currently performing screens uh, to try and identify compounds that could be uh, suitable to, for incorporations into uh, mosquito nets that we can uh, move forward uh, to uh, field trials. And in the next slide, uh, uh, um, we don't actually limit uh, the um, possibility of using antimalarials only to mosquito nets because in principle drugs could be uh, also incorporated into indoor uh, sprays similar to the IRS uh, methods that uh, Pedro was talking about earlier. And they could also be incorporated into sugar solutions um, in, uh, uh, that are attractive to uh, mosquitoes and um, in particular that are attractive to mosquitoes that live outdoors uh, and feed and, and rest outdoors. And so uh, they never come indoors uh, to feed uh, on people and rest, which means that they're not really targeted by current malaria control strategies like bed nets and indoor sprays which uh, are in, indoor based and they don't really um, kill mosquitoes that are uh, uh, outdoor, um, that have a, a more uh, outdoor based behavior. Um, so this would be uh, quite useful to uh, prevent uh, uh, transmission by those outdoor biting uh, mosquitoes. So there are different possibilities to deliver uh, those antimalarials to, this, uh, to these mosquitoes that are not limited to uh, mosquito nets. And so uh, this is, um, in a way, uh, a, our way of thinking about innovation in the field of malaria uh, control. Uh, we do need innovation, if I can have the next slide. And, um, and we, we think that this is like a, a promising proof of principle that we could go down this uh, strategy of using antimalarials uh, to kill uh, parasite transmission during uh, mosquito stages and preventing so uh, pathogen uh, propagation. And the model, mathematical models that we've used so far are promising. They show that this strategy could be uh, um, somehow useful in, in um, malaria endemic regions, especially uh, in regions where there is a uh, strong insecticide uh, resistance. And so uh, this could be used to extend the lifespan of um, bed nets and of drugs. And um, by using um, combinations of drugs that are different in humans versus uh, mosquitoes, then we could also limit the spread of uh, uh, re resistance in, in parasites. And so, um, you know, we have uh, a tool that can, can, be, um, can live longer in, in malaria endemic settings. 
And so this is all um, I want to tell you today, uh, but also want to acknowledge in the next slide uh, the people that are doing uh, this work. Uh, so um, uh, apart from the work by Doug, Ali and Ezra that are really uh, are pushing this project, I also want to acknowledge the entire group uh, at Harvard. Um, it's a wonderful group of, uh, of scientists really committed to uh, malaria research and really committed to helping one another. Um, this could never uh, this project and other projects in the lab could never be done um, in isolation. And also our wonderful group of uh, collaborators um, that I mentioned during my talk, uh, without whom really we could not um, we could not proceed. Um, science is a highly a collaborative uh, enterprise, as also we are seeing uh, these days with, with COVID. And also, uh, I want to thank our sponsors, in particular the NIH and uh, HHMI and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations for their uh, generous uh, support. Um, and thank you again for, for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here today. Thank you, Flaminia. This was great. I think it's, it's a very important message to also to young people to invent and uh, dare to, to, to enter innovative ideas, uh, to dare uh, to, to try crazy solutions, because uh, as you are showing, they really work. It's, it's, it's really great. Thank you, Pietro. <laughs> Before introducing the next speaker, what I would uh, do very, very briefly is to give you a, a, a glance of uh, what happens at uh, uh, Instituto Superior di Sanità, what uh, we are actually doing on malaria. Uh, but saying that, uh, I think it's important to remember that uh, malaria is obviously one part of a global uh, problem. And for this reason, particularly thinking of Africa, Instituto Superior di Sanità is launch has launched several, a few months ago, uh, the Ricerca Italia Africa uh, initiative. Uh, we are basically trying to create, to, to help, to contribute to uh, create a stable and uh, sustainable network of uh, Italy-Africa health research. Some objectives are uh, on the slide. Uh, hopefully we'll be able quite soon to present in a web page from uh, ISS uh, the results of a survey we recently conducted to map uh, Italian projects. And so far we've been mapping around about 40 uh, collaborative projects involving Italian researchers and partners in 18 African countries. Um, talking about malaria uh, and thinking of the past few decades in, uh, in ISS, I think I would like to convey this message, uh, how uh, our institute has been uh, a site for cross-fertilization of different fields of, uh, of research. Um, the example is here, like these two different branches of science, biophysics and malariology, uh, have been able in the late 80s to provide uh, new concepts, original ideas uh, that I would like just to mention very, very briefly. Um, we have uh, uh, a very important, innovative uh, um, line of research in which Giancarlo Maiori's team were at the time uh, exploring efficacy of uh, impregnated uh, curtains, in this case, impregnated materials to control vector uh, transmitted malaria in Africa. And obviously, it's very clear that this was one of the first steps of uh, the huge implementation strategy follow-up, which followed about uh, using and deploying impregnated bed nets to, to control transmission. On the other hand, uh, in parallel, in the same years, uh, the team of uh, Clara Frontali, who is a, who is a physicist, um, were really, for the first time, exploring what at the time really was a black box, uh, the, the malaria parasite genome, with very original uh, pieces of research, which again, on the other side, opened the way to uh, attack, to understanding and attacking the parasite with uh, cell and molecular biology tools. And basically, a lot of what we do here today in ISS is still along those uh, two uh, paths. Uh, in ISS, we, stu we study now biology uh, of transmission, uh, and of pathogenesis of malaria parasites. We address 
molecular epidemiology of drug resistance and uh, ISS does surveillance uh, largely of imported malaria cases. Uh, in ISS, we use medical entomology to map and follow the uh, anopheles population in our country, in our territory. But also we have uh, uh, an important activity from the ISS Museum uh, who kind of uh, talks to students uh, uh, and to the, the uh, new generations of what was malaria in Italy and what is malaria now worldwide. And uh, in occasion of this uh, uh, 50th anniversary uh, produced uh, this uh, um, experimental video that you can see at the ISS YouTube uh, Museum. I just like to zoom in into one aspect to, to give you a flavor of how we try to combine fundamental science, fundamental uh, research and uh, um, practical aspects of, of research, in particular on the human mosquito transmission stages. What we try to do is to, for instance, uh, uh, understand how these stages uh, hide and mature in the human bone marrow by approaching this complicated issue uh, in parallel with in in vitro, in vivo and uh, ex vivo um, approaches, we use our biological know-how to sort of collaborate to the development, for instance, in this case, of uh, a device which combines uh, uh, paramagnetic and uh, impedometric measurements with artificial intelligence to give you in a very, very short time uh, quantitative information uh, and also qualitative information on the stages of the circulating uh, parasites. Or in another project, how we try to devise a, mm, tools to predict uh, gametocyte infectiousness to mosquito on, on uh, the basis of a functional assay. Uh, another line of research is uh, to apply this biological um, uh, knowledge that we, we do have in ISS to develop assays which would enable uh, to screen large compound libraries as it has been done uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, this public and this private company uh, to find compounds which are promising hits for uh, killing gametocytes and blocking transmission in this uh, in this way uh, in other words you know this is a flavor in which we try to uh, to feed the strategy of evidence based uh, control of malaria and and malaria eradication uh, with you know very illuminating uh, uh, advisors from long ago you know from uh, much earlier than malariology in one case, and also uh, this gives me the occasion to, rem to remember a another uh, important um, advice of, uh, you know, uh, applying uh, fundamental biology uh, before uh, uh, translating it into, into research uh, through uh, Paolo Bianco, a collaborator of our, some of our studies, who uh, five years ago uh, we unfortunately we lost. This is really this idea of, of how fundamental biology and fundamental research can uh, feed in into the fight for malaria is really the, the note in which I really am happy to introduce the next speaker, uh, Gordon Awander, uh, because the school that he founded and now is directing in uh, Ghana is really an example of how fundamental no uh, research can be uh, taught to create the new generation of scientists fighting malaria in Africa, first of all, but also <coughs> how the knowledge can be used to generate the new uh, weapons that we need badly to, to have uh, for, for uh, uh, continuing the, the work of, uh, uh, along the path of uh, malaria eradication. So please, Gordon, this is now uh, our last presentation for the day, after which we can uh, collect questions and uh, have a brief discussion. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, Pietro, for the kind introduction. And thanks for the invitation. I'm really honored to be part of this very interesting uh, celebration of 50 years of uh, Malaria Free Italy. Uh, I'm bringing you the perspective from um, the part of the world where 
we are still struggling with malaria and uh, and dreaming of the day that we can also declare ourselves malaria free so as um as Pietro mentioned uh, for the past six years i've been leading a center at the university of ghana called WACBIP, which stands for the west africa center for cell biology of infectious pathogens and basically what we've done is my colleagues and i have tried to create a space where basic science research can be um, made interesting for young African scientists to, uh, you know, to develop their skills. So uh, we focused on cell and molecular biology and applying this to uh, various disease, um, you know, systems and uh, using that as a vehicle to train, um, you know, young scientists. Next slide, please. So uh, we started in 2014, and this was established as a research and training center. Um, and we are operating as a semi-autonomous unit under the College of Basic and Applied Sciences. Semi-autonomous simply means that we have to raise our own money and spend our own money. So the university does not um, put us in their annual budget, but we get to enjoy all the privileges of being a unit in a university, except getting a budget line. So anyway, so we started off with support from the World Bank through the African Centers of Excellence project. And then shortly after that, we got one of the Delta's grants from the uh, a collaboration between Wellcome Trust and the African Academy of Sciences. And really what we tried to do was to create a hub for biomedical research training and to be a center for producing homegrown globally competitive science leaders. And, and that's what we have been um, trying to deliver over the last few years. Next slide, please. So what we've done is to um, basically mobilize resources from various sources through various funding schemes to provide a full training pipeline uh, from you know graduate internships, uh, which are people from um, their bachelor's degree uh, through master's, PhD training to postdoctoral, and also to career development fellowships. And all these are uh, true fellowships that we have uh, provided uh, from various different sources uh, of funding. Next slide, please. So um, since the last academic year, we have now supported 246 scientists from 13 African countries. And on the map, you can see where all the trainees have come from and their level of training postdocs, PhD students, master's students. And uh, the majority are from Ghana, of course, and the West Africa sub-region, but we have some coming from as far as Eastern and Southern Africa, as you can see on the map. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, our research portfolio is wide. We do, you know, mostly infectious disease research but we actually also do some non-communicable diseases because we do human genetics and that gives us a bridge to non-communicable diseases. And for the infectious diseases, malaria is our uh, you know, biggest uh, footprint. Uh, that is partly because I'm a malaria person, but uh, also because it's a big problem in this part of the world. So we have a, a very big malaria research program and this is you know, very multidisciplinary. Uh, so here I've just captured some of the, uh, the branches of our malaria study, uh, where we start from, from the clinic and the communities where we uh, enroll uh, people with malaria or controls without malaria in the community. And we, the, the study really starts from there where people are looking at, you know, clinical presentations, looking at hematological indices, looking at diagnostics and, uh, you know, uh, how effective these diagnoses are. And part of that is also looking at the etiology of febrile illness because um, uh, in our part of the world, a lot of diseases are often misdiagnosed as malaria because the symptoms are so similar to so many uh, diseases. Um, others look at drug studies, looking at both drug resistance and trying new drugs. And then there's the immunological studies, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, then we also have groups doing genomics, um, where they look at um, parasite evolution and signatures of selection and things like that, but also using that to study drug resistance as well, looking for drug resistance markers. 
Um, my particular area, we do invasion studies looking at mechanisms of red cell invasion and looking at pathways which could be exploited for vaccine development. So this uh, just a snapshot of all the malaria um, you know, studies that we have at the center. So today I'm going to share with you just a few, um, you know, a, a few results from some of the, the studies that we've been doing uh, at the center. Next slide, please. One of the things that, that fascinated me since I, I started my group here at the University of Ghana has been looking at the relationship between, uh, you know, transmission intensity and the biology and the pathogenesis of uh, of malaria in, in terms of the immune response. And uh, so since I've been back, we have, uh, uh, you know, designed all our studies with this in mind and looking at it through uh, the lens of, uh, you know, malaria transmission. And this is also relevant because we're talking about, um, you know, eliminating malaria. And this has implications on how the parasite will behave and how the immune system will also respond as transmission decreases over time. And so what we've been doing is that we've uh, selected three areas in Ghana, which have distinct levels of transmission, uh, which is one of the interesting things about malaria transmission in Ghana. You have areas where transmission is still holo endemic, and then you have places where malaria is, uh, you know, just in the background and, you know, people hardly get malaria anymore. So um, Kintampo is one of the areas where we still have a lot of transmission. That's in the middle of Ghana in red. Uh, there you still have up to 250 infective bites um, a year. And then um, you go to Navrongo, where we have very seasonal transmission. Uh, that is towards the border with uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, then in Accra, which is uh, the capital city, where transmission is very low because it's a much more developed area and, uh, uh, you know, very, very much urban. Next slide, please. So typically, this is what you see when you go into a clinic and recruit children showing up with malaria in the three areas. So typically, you see that um, in order of decreasing malaria transmission from Kintampo to Accra, you find that children showing up in Accra are usually uh, slightly older than those showing up in Navrongo and Kintampo. Um, their hemoglobin is usually better. Their parasite load is usually lower, um, but they usually have higher fevers. So those in Accra, much higher fevers uh, compared to those in the other places. And, and so this has really picked our interest that there may be some type of parasite tolerance in the more, uh, you know, the places with higher transmission. Next slide, please. So we will be looking at both adaptive immune responses and uh, innate immune responses. So for us, we've been interested in red cell invasion. So one of the things we did was to look at immune responses in children, um, antibody responses against the, the common red cell invasion um, ligands. That, you know, the, the, the proteins that the parasite uses to invade um, you know, human red blood cells. And um, these usually, these are, uh, um, they fall into two major categories, the EBA proteins and the RH proteins. And um, I'm not going to bore you with what all these uh, different proteins are, but uh, this is just a selection of some of the, the important proteins that are involved in red cell invasion. So uh, we did ELISA, you, you know, using antibodies from children, uh, sorry, using plasma from children uh, in the three areas. And we were looking to see whether there were any patterns in uh, antibody levels if you move from a high transmission area to a low transmission area. And what we found was that, you know, they, there was no, um, you know, uniform pattern. Some, for some antigens, the antibodies uh, decreased with decreasing transmission, others, the antibodies actually increased with in, uh, decreasing transmission. And others, there was no difference across the transmission, uh, transmission areas. Uh, but you can see there that, uh, you know, vaccine candidates such as RH4, RH5 with very low responses in all the three areas. What was clear though was that, um, you know, age definitely was associated with higher responses, which, which makes sense. So we're happy to see that um, older children generally had 
better responses than younger ones, as you can see in the lower panel. Next slide, please. The other thing that um, was interesting was that the breadth of the response in, in the sense that how many um, of the antigens did the children recognize. So if you move from Accra to, sorry, from Kintampo to Accra in decreasing transmission, you find that in Kintampo, you, you had most of the children recognizing, you know, between one to five antigens. Uh, you come to Accra, the majority are recognizing zero to two antigens, and, and then Nabron was in between. So it clearly shows that um, the, the children who are in Kintampo recognize a broader range of antigens, whereas those in Accra with the lowest transmission uh, recognized only a few of the antigens. Next slide, please. Um, so we, we took this further and we, we recruited adults from Kintampo where we had the highest transmission um, uh, levels. And we looked at antibody levels to the same antigens. And what we found was that it was basically the same that um, there was, you know, there, was, uh, dif there were differences in the responses to different antigens and those differences were not really uh, specific to the transmission area, but more specific to the, the antigens. Uh, some were better than others. And again, you see RH5 not, uh, not having very strong responses. Then we looked at um, the ability of, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, plasma to, um, to inhibit invasion in vitro. So we, uh, we did some crude experiment, some experiments with crude plasma, and then we went ahead to purify um, total IgG from the plasma samples. And then we used uh, those to do invasion inhibition um, assays in vitro. And you find a wide range of invasion inhibitory activities, as you can see here for you know the individual um, adults in the lower panel. So this, each of these is a, a different person and you find differences in uh, the inhibitory activity. Next slide, please. If you look at those in terms of, um, you know, how many antigens were recognized and how that um, related to the inhibition. Um, first, we found that um, a majority of the adults recognized three to five antigens, as you can see in the panel A. Uh, we found that there was no uh, association with age. And that, again, makes sense because these are adults. And as you know, the immunity basically peaks at a certain age. and your level of immunity remains the same no matter how old you are. Um, but we found that the number of antigens that were recognized was directly proportional to the percentage inhibition. So in the panel C, you see that um, uh, there's a positive correlation between the percentage inhibition and the number of um, ligands that uh, the individual recognized. Next slide, please. And if you look at each of the individual antigens, antibodies to each of them, had some level of correlation with uh, uh, inhibition of invasion uh, individually. You know, different degrees of, of strength of collaboration, uh, correlation, but there was some correlation. So then we decided to look at them um, together using a, a you know, multivariate model. So next slide, please. So we did different combinations of, uh, of antigens to see which combination of antibodies gave you the best inhibition. Uh, and it, this was, you know, with an eye towards vaccine development. If you are going to have a multi-antigen uh, uh, vaccine, which antigens would you put together to give you the best chance of inhibiting invasion? And when we did this, it was interesting. We found that if you had more antigens, it wasn't necessarily better. So uh, we found that the optimal, uh, the optimal inhibition uh, was when you had three antigens. And so we looked at the different combinations of three antigens, and we found a combination of antibodies to RH2, RH4, and RH5 gave us the strongest inhibition, uh, which remains significant after correcting for multiple comparisons, as you can see here. Next slide, please. Then we also did some studies on the innate immune response. So we looked at cytokine responses, and this was because we found uh, these differences in fever 
And as you know, um, you know, the federal uh, response is often driven by inflammatory cytokines. And we found that as uh, we suspected, um, children in Accra had, you know, stronger inflammatory responses compared to those in Avrongo and Kitapo. You could, you could see, you know, a nice correlation between transmission intensity from, if you go from Kitapo to Accra, um, you know, with the levels of cytokine uh, responses. So uh, it seems like children who were less exposed um, responded much more robustly to the cytokines uh, compared to those that were more exposed in Kitapo. Next slide, please. Um, if you took this further and did um, a regression analysis, you would see that um, there's a positive correlation between parasitemia and cytokine levels in Accra alone. So if you look at these graphs, Accra is the solid black line, um, Navrongo is the dotted black line, and then Kitapo is the dotted red line. And you see that both Navrongo and Kitapo, which are high transmission areas, there's no correlation between parasite load or level of parasitemia and the cytokine production. So it seems like in high transmission areas, um, the induction of the immune response is sort of uh, peaked. So it's, it's refractory to increasing parasitemia. So whether you have a few parasites or you have you know, thousands of parasites or hundreds of thousands of parasites, there wasn't uh, much of a, an increase in the production of cytokines. And we think that this is an interesting phenom phenomenon which points to some type of tolerance to the parasite. And, and, and we think that this is part of the acquisition of uh, immunity to clinical malaria uh, in the high transmission areas. Next slide, please. So we, we investigated this further and we did a small longitudinal study where we chose children in Accra and Kitapo, which were the two most distinct areas with transmission intensity. And you'd see here that um, if you look at the children we selected, um, again, you see fever much higher in Accra than uh, Kintampo. You see the temperature. And also, you could see that if you look at the number of times they've had previous episodes of malaria, you see that clearly in Kintampo, um, you know, about 80% of them have had two or more previous episodes, whereas in Accra, less than 10 of, 10 of them, 10% uh, of them had more than two, uh, you know, two or more uh, previous episodes. So that gives you a clear distinction between children who have been heavily exposed to those who, who have been only lightly exposed. Next slide, please. So um, we did the cytokine levels again for day 0, day 7, and day 21 after treatment. And you see here that, uh, uh, you know, the trend shows that there's some increase in cytokine production on day zero when they have the acute malaria. And then by day seven, most have normalized and, and then uh, day 21, uh, you know, all of them have normalized. Uh, it was interesting and curious to notice that, you know, interferon gamma, interferon alpha um, in children in Kintampo who are the red lines, there was hardly a significant increase in cytokine levels if you compared day zero to, let's say, day seven or day 21, which, which are, uh, you know, the steady state levels. So, again, it confirms that it seems that in children who are super exposed, um, they just find a way to tolerate the parasite without, um, you know, inducing a very uh, strong inflammatory response. And we think this is this is part of the survival mechanism to avoid severe clinical disease. Next slide, please. And if you look at this further, we, we did some network analysis of the cytokines, and you see that if you take the 21 as the normal, uh, you know, uh, relationship between the cytokines, so you, have, you see a nice uh, network, neat, um, you know, uniform network. Um, Day seven is a little bit distorted, but the distortion is really on day zero. That's when they have the acute uh, infection. And you can see that the distortion is much more in Accra than in Kitapu. And the distortion is 
around Rantis and interferon gamma. And you can see that the difference between a crank example is the interferon gamma, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, one of the key pro inflammatory side effects. And, and this again uh, was very interesting uh, and tells us that the inflammatory response is very critical to how children respond to uh, the infection. Uh, we have cells from these, uh, uh, these children, and we are now doing some transcriptome analysis. And we also have uh, the plasma for antibody work. And uh, all these data are looking very interesting, and uh, we will be sharing soon when we complete the analysis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So to, to summarize, um, um, if, you, if you look at uh, the three areas in Ghana, and you model that to reflect what will happen when there's decreasing transmission in areas of high transmission like ours, you find that the vulnerable age will shift to a, an older uh, older group, uh, you know, as you can see in Accra. We find that that comes with a cost because then um, there's less exposure. And so the breadth of antibody responses um, uh, is narrower. That means fewer antigens are recognized. And we found that if, if there's going to be a combination of uh, antigens that will give a very good response that can inhibit uh, invasion, um, RH2, RH4, RH5 would be a good combination. Um, we found that the, um, you know, um, the in, in in inflammatory response is quite um, important in um, inducing parasite tolerance. So in individuals that are exposed to a lot of malaria transmission, they have developed a mechanism to not overproduce cytokines when they are affected with malaria parasites. And, I, and we think that this is a mechanism by which uh, fever is controlled and the uh, clinical symptoms are also controlled. Um, so if you take it all together, what we're saying is that reducing transmission is good, but if you don't actually eliminate it, then you are actually putting people at risk because they are losing immunity and they are losing parasite tolerance. And so for us, we need a vaccine so we can all get to where Italy is uh, in the next few years. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few slides of acknowledgements to our, you know, our team. You know, these are the people in my lab who do malaria work. Uh, to the management of WagBib, next slide is uh, the support staff who help me to run the operations of the center. Next slide. And then to our collaborators all across the world, um, including Kelly and others who help us to support these young people and, and to uh, you know promote their careers. Uh, we have a whole range of funders, next slide, uh, who support various aspects of our operations. And we are very grateful for all the support from all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. It was, uh... Great presentation. A couple of questions were pointing to maybe the obvious issue nowadays, and I think this is for uh, Pedro Alonso really to, to give us uh, uh, ideas about that, which is obviously uh, the impact of COVID-19, you know, how the pandemic is really uh, affecting everything we are doing, you are doing uh, in the fight against malaria. So, so back in March, when all of this started, we got very worried, also because there were uh, strong messages coming even from, in this case, particularly within Africa, to stay home, um, um, where possible, avoid going to a health facility, um, even fever if it's not serious and and this represented a, a a major challenge because it it went directly against what has been for the last 40 or 50 years a key driver of malaria control which is if you if you have fever don't wait malaria can kill you very quickly quickly go and seek diagnosis and treatment so that was number one number two is that this led to the uh, stopping of 
key campaigns, distribution of indoor residu of uh, bed nets, indoor residual spraying, seasonal malaria chemo prevention. So at that time, we performed together with colleagues from Oxford and others, a modeling exercise to try to estimate what would this imply. The there were different scenarios to cut a long story short, uh, some of the worst case scenarios, but which looked very likely uh, back in April, suggested that we could actually double malaria mortality within 2020. This was allowed us to launch a strong campaign. And um, I think uh, the bottom line has been most of the vertical approaches, bevited net distribution, SMCs and so on, have by and large taken place. Um, avoiding this false dichotomy of uh, COVID or malaria, you have to do both and could be done, and both could be done in a safe, in a safe way. So that component has worked very well. Where we have a lot more difficulty now is in measuring the degree of disruption to diagnosis and treatment. And this probably because a, there are not very good data, and we've been, really been working on triangulating different types of information. Secondly, because it, it, it does change. It's not a fixed picture. In some places it may happen, then it stops, and then somewhere else it happens. You will see the report that we will publish in, on Monday aims to estimate the likely impact of the service disruption on access to diagnosis and treatment in sub-Saharan Africa. And it goes from somewhere 20,000 extra deaths to about 100,000 extra deaths, depending if you go from 10 to 50% disruption. It's hard to say where, we've, where we are, but I think we're probably in around a 20 to 30% disruption. And that would probably mean that we ha may have had around an extra 50,000 deaths in Africa this year. Uh, due to, to malaria. So it's, it's, a, it's a big problem. And the problem is not going to go away. We're very encouraged by the news on the vaccine and, and so on. But uh, I think we have to be ready uh, for quite some more uh, happening. And, uh, and so I think we've managed reasonably well these first few months, but we have to be ready to continue to find ways to be able to avoid as much as possible service disruption while operating in a, in a COVID-19 safe environment. Thank you so much, Alison. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we meet soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>